Did you face a problem this week that didn't have an easy answer? A challenge that required you to search for a solution, to use your creative imagination, perhaps professionally or personally? You probably did. J.P. Guilford, one of the pioneering researchers in the field of creativity, said that to live is to have problems, and to solve problems creatively is to grow. The bottom line is that we all face challenges. We all face problems. One definition of a problem is it's the gap between what we have and what we want. And often we need creative thinking when we don't know how to close that gap. In fact, that's when we especially need creative thinking, when the solution to help us close that gap is not there, ready for us to pick it up and to implement. And we have to search for that solution. We have to generate that solution ourselves. Recall, creativity is the production of novel solutions. These are novel solutions that help us to resolve open-ended problems. Problems that have multiple directions that we can go in, that have multiple right answers, versus closed-ended problems. Closed-ended problems have a known solution, a single right answer. This lecture examines a universal process, the steps and stages of thought that we move through to close that gap between what we have and what we want. Research shows that everyone goes through these steps, whether it's superstar, big creativity, or everyday creativity. Graphic analysis of people who've created drawings of the process that they mo move through to solve problems in their professional personal lives reflect these stages that we'll be introduced to in this lecture. The past three lectures looked at two fundamental creative thinking skills divergent and convergent thinking. We now put those two skills into a full and complete creative process. From the beginning of the process, where we identify the challenge that we want to work on, all the way through to the successful implementation of a new useful solution. So what is that universal process? In this course, we'll be looking at a model called creative problem solving. And in creative problem solving, there are four stages, four steps that we move through. The first is called clarify. In clarify, we're identifying the challenge or challenges that need to be worked on. In the second step, we call it ideate. We begin to generate ideas. These are tentative solutions. In the third step of the process, we take those tentative solutions, those initial concepts and ideas, and we turn them from good, promising ideas into really great solutions. And then finally, in the fourth step, we have to put legs on our ideas. We have to move our solutions from our own head into reality. We call this step implement. I refer to this process as creative problem solving, the creative problem solving process. Let me break down each word in this process. Creative means our goal is to look for novelty. By problem, we mean we're attempting to close the gap between where we are and where we wish to be. And by solving, we're meeting the needs of the situation. We're resolving the situation. The focus is on producing something useful and valuable. And finally, we call this a process because there are identifiable and deliberate steps and procedures in this process and tools. And because it's a process, it's a method that's learnable and repeatable. So, why use creative problem solving in this course? Why use that as our creative model to organize our tools that we'll be learning and applying? Well, firstly, creative problem solving is intuitive and it's natural. It's not designed to replace our natural creative process. Rather, it builds on this process. 
And the second reason is that it's research-based. The creative problem-solving process has perhaps been the most widely researched deliberate creative process model. In fact, a meta-analytic study that went after the basic question, can creativity be trained, evaluated some 70 different studies that looked at programs for creativity. It looked at these 70 different studies and it concluded that creative problem solving was one of the most effective methods used in creativity training. You see, the most effective methods are cognitive models, models in which we're given thinking strategies, thinking tools that help us to guide and direct our thinking. Another reason why we're looking at creative problem solving and using that in this course is that it's highly generalizable. It can be used in all areas of life. Some creative process models are a bit more domain specific. TRIZ, the inventive thinking process that originated in Russia, is designed mainly for engineers. The other reason why we've selected creative problem solving is that we know that it requires the use of different mental operations. And in this way, because creative thinking is a higher order thinking skill that has subskills to it, we're, we're taking those subskills and we're improving upon those skills in order to achieve this complex form of thinking. Now, because creative problem solving and these steps that I just described to you of clarify, ideate, develop, and implement involve different ways of thinking, we can look at how people connect to that process. Psychologists call it cognitive style. That's a preference for how we process and organize information, how we engage in thinking. And what we've discovered through research is that when you look at creative problem solving, we all don't move through creative problem solving in the same way. While we all use creative problem solving, and it's natural for us to be creative problem solvers, we may have a preference for some mental operations within this process, some of the steps in the process over other steps in the process. I'm gonna invite you to test this out. Let's have an experience. Let's look and see what your connection is to creative problem solving. If you're in a place where you can record your responses, that would be helpful. If not, that's okay. You can be like JK Rowling and do this in your mind. So what I'd like you to do is to record the numbers one, two, three, and four, just in a column. And I'd like you to think about these four steps of the creative problem solving process. And I'm gonna ask you to prioritize these four steps relative to yourself. No right or wrong answer, it's just your opinions about yourself. And let me help you out. So think about these four areas of the process. Let me review them again. Clarify is where you closely examine a situation to define the problem, to identify the challenges. You're closely examining the situation. Ideate is a more playful way of thinking. It's generating possibilities, it's brainstorming. The third step, develop, is taking an idea and perfecting and improving upon it. And then fourth, we have implement, which is taking action. Now, choose which one of those four steps comes most naturally to you. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you have the greatest energy for? Which one gives you great energy? And write that in next to number one. Now, let's go to the opposite end. Let's think about number four. We've eliminated one, three steps remain. Of the three steps that remain, which one of these three do you struggle with? You really have to concentrate. It takes energy for you to do it. Doesn't come naturally to you. And write that in next to number four. That will leave two steps. Next to number two, write in of the two remaining steps, the one that you prefer, the one that comes most naturally to you. 
And obviously that leaves number three blank and it leaves one more step. That can get slotted in next to number three. Now I do this with groups as a warm up to get individuals to see how creative problem solving is in a way already inside of them. What we use this exercise for in addition to that is to have people then compare their results with someone else. And when they do this, they discover something interesting. They discover something that I call psychological diversity. We talk about diversity and the value of diversity. In fact, diversity has been shown to enhance and improve creativity. But we tend to think about diversity as the kind of diversity that you see, the kind of diversity related to ethnicity, race, gender, and age. Psychological diversity refers to the kind of diversity that's in our head that relates to how we think and behave in different ways. So what people often discover when they start to compare how they rank these four steps to someone else is, gosh, your rankings are completely different from mine. I have implement as my highest preference and look, you have ideate or clarify. So in this way, we begin to discover that we have preferences for these steps of the creative process. Some will be more comfortable with, others may be a little less comfortable for us. Now, Great Courses has provided two ways for you to complete the full measure. There's a psychological measure that's been around for some time that's been shown to be reliable and valid, a more scientific way of examining these preferences. It's called Foresight. And if you look into your guidebook, you can find instructions on how to complete this tool, this tool called Foresight. When we take these four steps of the process and we personify them, we call them clarifier, ideator, developer, and implementer. So someone who prefers clarify, we call them a clarifier. Someone who prefers ideate, we call them an ideator. Develop, developer. Implement, implementer. We're going to go into each of these preferences and we'll explore the meaning behind these preferences. Now, notice that I'm referring to these as preferences. They're not abilities. If you have a high preference to ideate, and you wrote that in next to number one, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a genius ideator. What it means is that that's where you have your energy. That's what comes naturally to you. You tend to think in ideational ways. To drive this point home, I'm gonna ask you to do something for me. And if you're in a place where you can do this, that's fine, you'll find this useful. But you can also do this in your mind as well. And I think you'll get the point behind the exercise rather quickly. So if you're somewhere where you can write, take a pen or a pencil and sign your name as if you were signing a check or a contract. Now, how did that go? Probably felt comfortable to you, probably felt natural, it was easy. Now take your pen and put it in your non-preferred hand if you're right-handed and your left hand and vice versa. Now sign your name a second time next to your first signature. How did that go? Probably took more time. Probably felt a little awkward. Probably really had to concentrate in order to do that. So this is an analogy. Like handedness, we have different preferences for ways of thinking. There are areas within this creative process that will meet our preferences, just like we have a preference for the right hand over the left hand. And when we're using that way of thinking, it will flow. It will feel natural. It'll feel comfortable. But you can use different preferences. You can switch your hands and you can write with the other hand. It might feel a little uncomfortable because it's not preferred, but you can do it. So let's go into these preferences now that we recognize that they're not necessarily about ability. And let's start with the clarifier. So if you rank this as your highest preference or you've had the opportunity to already complete the foresight measure, this is likely to describe you. The clarifier is the person in the meeting who's calling a halt to the discussion and is saying, are we really solving the right problem? 
they tend not to be too quick to move to solutions. They enjoy doing research and gathering information. They attend to the details. They're methodical in making sure they do their homework. They tend to ask lots of questions because they need information. Now, if you take any of these preferences to an extreme, there can be a liability. And the liability for a clarifier is analysis paralysis. They may overanalyze. We can all be annoying. We can rub people the wrong way. And each of these preferences have their own unique way of doing this. Clarifiers annoy others by asking too many questions, being too realistic, overloading people with information. Now, for each preference, I'll give you an example of a person I consider to be a creative representation of that preference. And for the clarifier, I'm going to suggest that Irish journalist Veronica Guerin is an example of a creative clarifier. She's credited with bringing down organized crime in Dublin. There were many unsolved crimes at the time. Drug use was up, but no one knew why. She conducted, conducted deep investigation. She initially used her accountant's training and her business experience to take fraud reporting to an entirely new level of detail. She craved first-hand information, first-hand detail. She showed little regard for her, for, for her personal safety in chasing down these stories and getting to the heart of the matter, to the truth. In a moment's notice, she would fly off and chase a lead, literally. She used a technique called doorstepping, where she'd show up and pummel someone with questions. It was described that her work was undiluted. She, she, she searched for truth and details, and ultimately it created change and improved the situation. Sadly, she was assassinated in 1996. Let's move to the next preference. We call this one ideator. If you rank this as your highest area ideate in that ranking exercise we did earlier, this is likely to describe you. But if it was your lowest ranking, it's important to understand that there are people like this. Ideators look at the big picture. They dream of possibilities. They toy with ideas. They're highly fluent. You need an idea, go to an ideator. They don't know where the stop button is. They stretch their imagination. They will offer out-of-the-box ideas. They're intuitive. They take an intuitive approach to problem solving. They jump from A to Z. They can't tell you how they did that, but they often do that. They're adventurous and they're dreamers. Take this to an extreme and the potential liability for an ideator is that they may overlook the details. How might they annoy others? Drawing attention to themselves. Not being able to stick to one idea being abstract, offering ideas that are off the wall. Sometimes, in fact, they offer ideas that are off the wall just to get a reaction from other people. Here's a quote from an ideator. I was shocked at college to see 100 of my classmates in the library all reading copies of the same book. Instead of doing as they did, I went into the stacks and read the first book written by an author whose name began with Z. I received the highest grade in the class. That convinced me that the institution was not being run correctly, and I left. This is a quote from John Cage. He's an influential 20th century American composer. His ideas were original and sometimes even shocking. Imagine this. You walk into the performance hall. The conductor comes out and he stands in front of the orchestra, and he does nothing. He stands there for four minutes and 33 seconds. This was a piece written by John Cage. The purpose was to get the audience to tune into the sounds naturally occurring in their environment. Another revolutionary idea of John Cage was the prepared piano, where objects like nuts and bolts were placed into the piano to alter the sound. Originality and a diverse range of ideas, independent in nature, Seems to me that John Cage, though he never completed foresight, exemplifies the ideator preference. Let's look at the developer preference. 
Now, I'll be honest with you, this is where I get to be a little more comfortable because this is one of my preferences. Developer takes an idea and tinkers with it. They improve upon it. In some ways, uh, in an earlier lecture with the Beatles, we looked at how they stayed focused in their studio work and refined and refined the songs that they were performing. Developers put together workable solutions. They analyze and compare competing solutions, looking at the pros and the cons. They can get lost in a single idea, going very deeply into it. They craft and refine and perfect a single idea, working it up into a fantastic solution. The potential liability for a developer is that they're perfectionists. They may get stuck developing the perfect solution. How they may annoy others is being too nitpicky, finding flaws in others' ideas, getting locked into one approach. Here's a newspaper quote of someone I think who displays a developer preference. Because he's been on the top of the comic heap for so long, it is easy to assume that Mr. Rock can make the whole big room shake with the same convulsive laughter because he was born that way. Like Tiger Woods, Bill Clinton, or Tom Brady, he seems genetically predisposed to do precisely what he does. Born to be funny, innate talent, maybe. Certainly, I think, hard work, and I think this reflects the developer tendency. Chris Rock may also be an ideator. In fact, you can have multiple preferences. If you use the foresight measure, you can see this in your profile. So it's likely that he may be an ideator as well. But I also think that his process shows developer qualities. You see, before a really big show, he begins by making appearances in small comedy clubs to test out his jokes. He shows up unannounced. There may be as few as 50 people in the audience. His ideas are sketched out on a yellow legal pad. He might perform for 45 minutes, and out of that, walk away with five to 10 good lines. Get this, he does this 40 to 50 times before he appears in a big show. That sounds like a developer. The fourth area, the fourth preference is called implementer. This is my highest preference. These are individuals who are quick to action, always moving forward. They love to see ideas brought to fruition. This is the person in meeting who pounds the table and says, all right, enough discussion. Let's make a decision and move forward. They want to see things happen. They take the Nike approach, if you remember the old Nike slogan, just do it. They're decisive and determined, and the potential liability, and I know I suffer from this, is they sometimes leap to action too quickly. They might annoy others by being too pushy, expressing their frustration readily when others do not move as quickly as they're moving, and overselling their ideas. So a creative implementer? I would suggest Dean Kamen as an example of a creative implementer. With more than 400 patents, you might think Dean Kamen is an ideator. With novel ideas like the Segway, certainly possible that he may have an ideator preference as well. But Dean Kamen gets things done, even from an early age. Before he graduated from high school, he automated the Times Square ball drop for New Year's Eve. He built control systems for sound and light shows in his basement. And he had contracts with Hayden Planetarium, the Four Seasons, and the Museum of the City of New York. In fact, before he graduated from high school, and this was in the 1960s, he was earning $60,000 a year. And he kept right on going. In 1976, at age 25, he founded his first company, Auto Syringe, and he sold it before age 30. Following the sale of Auto Syringe, he founded DECA Research and Development Corporation. So, there's another combination that I should mention to you. Some of you may have experienced this. I talked about clarifiers and ideators and developers and implementers independently. But there are some folks who struggle, perhaps struggled with that activity that we did earlier where you had to rank these four steps, and they struggle in that they like all four stages of the creative process. Their energy is equally distributed across all four. There aren't peak preferences or low preferences, no peaks or valleys in their profile. 
we call these individuals integrators. And integrators have some unique qualities. And something that's unique to the integrator when they work on teams is that they like to focus on harmony and relationships and collaboration and cooperation. They're excellent team members because team chemistry is important to them. They easily relate to the other preferences. So we've talked about clarifiers, ideators, developers, implementers, and integrators. How is this valuable? What are the individual implications? Well, first of all, it can improve your creative performance, understanding where you perhaps flow and excel in the creative process and perhaps where you come up short in the creative process. And where you come up short, where you don't have preferences, you might tend to skip those stages, those steps of thinking. We can get around that by learning tools. If something doesn't come naturally to you, you can learn a tool. In fact, that's how I got into the field of creativity. You see, I'm a low ideator. That's my lowest preference. When I was first introduced to the field of creativity, I was amazed by all these ideation tools that made this way of thinking easier for me. We have tools for clarify, tools for ideate, tools for develop, and tools for implement. Now, there are also implications for how we team. Sometimes when we're working with others who have a different prefer preference from us, there's friction, there's conflict. And by understanding these differences, we can hopefully move to a place where we begin to appreciate the differences. And ultimately, strong teams have a mix of these preferences, and they're able to complement one another. Here's a real life story. This is a story about a married couple, Carl and Gertie Corey. The insights that they made into carbohydrate metabolism led to improved treatment for diabetes. In fact, because of this, they won the Nobel Prize in 1947 for chemistry. As biochemists, they insisted on collaborating in the laboratory. In fact, when they were offered university positions, they would turn down the position if they weren't permitted to work together in the laboratory. They were collaborative creators. Here are three quotes. In these quotes, I think you'll begin to see how their foresight preferences made them a powerful team. This is a quote from a postdoc who worked in the lab with them. They were a remarkable pair, he said. Gertie would have flights of fancy. She'd come up with extraordinary ideas. Carl had the ability to put them into concrete questions to answer. And therefore, as a team, they were extraordinary. This is what their son had to say about his parents. Mother had the ideas. Then they would both go into the lab to execute the idea or disprove it. And here's a, here's a quote from Carl Corey from the speech that he delivered at the Nobel banquet. He said, our efforts have been largely complementary, and one without the other would not have gone as far as in combination. So what's the value of understanding your preferences? Well, one is individual management, managing yourself and managing your development, learning tools that make up for your preferences. You can't use your low preferences as a, as a shield. I'm a low ideator. I can't say, I'm sorry, I don't ideate. Don't ask me for ideas. Again, The Great Courses has provided you with ways to complete the measure if you choose to look at a scientific way of recognizing and, and examining your full profile. Consider doing this and consider sharing your results with others. Because remember, I mentioned that we have individual implications, understanding ourselves and managing ourselves, but this also has massive implications for relationships. I encourage you to share your results with others and perhaps get others to go through the warm-up exercise that we did so you might see their preferences or make the foresight measure available to them and compare your results. Identify differences and similarities. Discuss how, the, how this might impact your relationship. A main activity we do with others is to solve problems together. And by understanding these different preferences or these similar preferences, 
it might help us to be more effective in terms of how we solve problems together. And finally, don't stop there. Share your individual results with others, as many as you can, so that they can better understand you. Again, lectures 8 through 19, we dive into each of the creative problem solving steps, learning tools. Knowing your preference will help you to maximize the benefit of these tools as we go through them so that you can practice those areas that either complement what you already do naturally or to use tools that help to fill in areas that may not naturally come to you. And understanding your process preferences along with someone else in your life just might help you to have an even stronger relationship. And I'll see you next time.